So, um, Matthew, thank you for having us here. It's it's a pleasure to to talk to you all, and, and we do quite a few of these 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 sessions with with um, organisations that, that are wanting to know about what we at Slow the Flow have done. Um, uh, so, so you know, it's a, it's a pleasure to come and talk to you guys. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping bits first. I am going to mute everybody just in case the dog starts barking or you know somebody. Uh, you know, somebody is is having some distraction in the background. It won't distract me then. Um, so we'll, I'll, uh, well, at the end of the session, um, obviously, if you want to ask a question, just jot it down and we'll take questions right at the end. Um, if you haven't already done so, if you could just jot into the chat box your name and where you're from and what organisation you, you, you represent, that would be fabulous as well. Um, I think me and Amanda, uh, Amanda and I will probably talk for half an hour, something like that. Um, it's difficult to say because obviously these, these sessions tend to be a bit organic in some respects. So we'll, we'll do half an hour, 35 minutes, and then we'll take some questions. So in theory, we could be through by about half eight, 20 to nine, something like that. But, you know, please ask as many questions. I'm going to cover a lot of areas tonight, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of areas, but not, maybe not huge amount of detail. Uh, so you may have a particular question. Um, I'm Adrian Horton and I, I'm a trustee at Slow the Flow uh, and we are um, an organisation that was set up just after the, um, the, the Boxing Day floods uh, in 2015 and uh, we set, we went about uh, a group, set about a, a group uh, looking at the reasons why the Calder Valley floods. Now the Calder Valley is a very steep sided valley that runs between kind of brick house and uh, Brigham House in West Yorkshire and sort of getting on towards Burnley. And it, what's, it's what's called a, a rapid response catchment. So it's a very uh, steep sided in areas catchment of, uh, when it rains, it rains and the water runs off extremely quickly. Um, so, so we had to, we wanted to find out really what the reasons were behind, behind you know, the Calder Valley flooding. It's not just about the quantity of rain, clearly. It is about the quantity of rain, but it's not just about the quantity of rain. Um, so this evening's session, we're just going to be um, talking a bit about who we are, what we did, how we've come to get to come together as a group, and one or two of the projects that we've, we've undertaken over the last four and a half years. We're a fully constituted charity now. Um, and, and, and as such, you know, that, that, does, that does give us some extra sort of influence and clout, we hope, uh, in, in trying to shape uh, flood policy locally to us uh, and also nationally as well. Uh, Amanda McDermott is one of our, our trustees and Amanda specialises, uh, she's actually a landscape architect. Uh, is that right, Amanda? Landscape architect? Yeah, that's right. A landscape architect is my day job. There we go. And uh, Amanda sort of specialises as well in, in sustainable drainage schemes, which are things that we can all do in our, in our, in our local towns and villages. So Amanda will be talking about that. Um, so um, I'm going to start right back at the beginning. OK, and, and I kind of touched upon why we why we came together. And in doing so, we decided that we really needed to try and prove and understand why natural flood management and natural processes work, working with natural processes work, and proving that they do. Um, and the only way of really understanding those things is actually getting off your backside and actually getting out there and doing stuff, okay, which is what we essentially did. And we got the permission of uh, the National Trust, uh, who own a huge, great uh, tract of land um, in uh, near, near, near Hebden Bridge, uh, heavily wooded. It's ancient forest. It's a beautiful part of the world. It's absolutely fabulous part of the world. And part of their forestry plan, because obviously, you know, the National Trust take the responsibilities very carefully. Um, you know, they, they do have to manage the forest, manage the woodland. And in doing so, they do periodically fell trees. Um, and we put to good use those trees to develop a scheme de uh, devising and developing and building leaky woody dams. Now leaky woody dams uh, are a, a one aspect of natural flood management, which I'm going to talk about now. There are others which we'll come to shortly, but they are an opportunity to slow the flow of water down channels and down rivers um, to reduce the flood peak. The flood peak, as we know, is the thing that creates all the damage and devastation in our towns and villages. 
And if you can slow the flow, so not all the water arrives at the bottom of the valley in one go, uh, then you stand a chance of, uh, you know, reducing that flood peak. And we did that by utilizing these, this ba big batch of land, big uh, lad load of land in, in near Hebden Bridge um, by utilizing our volunteers. And we recruited volunteers through, uh, through our um, social media channels. Okay, basically it was really just a, a massive social media campaign. We have a great uh, Facebook group. We have a wonderful Twitter feed. We have YouTube channels. We have our website. We have emails. You know, we know each other quite well, much like you guys do. And we put together these teams of volunteers. And every two Sundays a month, we would meet in Hardcastle Crags and we would build leaky dams. And using the wood that was felled from the forestry plan, some of these are just one log across. Uh, some of them are three or four. Um, and the water in doing this backs up behind the leaky dams um, and goes, uh, goes underneath the leaky dams at a lot, at a lot slower rate. Um, and so hopefully it slows the flow and then the water does not arrive in the bottom of the valley all in one go. So over the car past three years or so, we've had hundreds of volunteers, probably a thousand volunteers come to us over the time, to be fair. Um, We've had thousands of volunteer hours, you know, three or four, five hours every Sunday, every other Sunday morning. We've had volunteers from the ages of five to 75, you know, people from all ages. It's not just, you don't have to be big and strong to pick up these big lumps of wood. You know, there's brash to collect, there's uh, the branches to prepare. So there's sawing to do and logs to move. And, and it's a great opportunity to bring the community together to do something meaningful. And people would come because they have been flooded. They wanted to do something tangible to affect the, uh, the way that water moves through the valley. And as a result, we were having these, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people every Sunday morning coming along to build these leaky dams. It was fantastic. It was amazing. Pre-COVID, I might add, we've not done anything all year. But up until March, we were there, you know, twice a month for, 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 four, for three years. We've now completed around 620 leaky dams in that area. Um, which has had a significant effect on, uh, on, on the flood risk. Um, and when I say significant, it's a little bit difficult to gauge exactly the success of these, which I'll come to in a moment. But anecdotally, it would certainly appear that what we've done has had an effect on the river levels, um, albeit in a very small way, into Hebden Bridge. Um, we've had a lot of media coverage on this. We've had um, them visit from uh, Country File, from Panorama, from the local newspapers, the local uh, TV, local TV stations. And whatever you do, um, I encourage you, really encourage you to, 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 to court the media. Do not be afraid to go out and get relationships with the people in the local media and the national media, because they will be the people that put Harper's Brook on the map. As, and it's the reason why you're probably talking to us today is because you know, we've become very well known in doing what we do. Um, and, you know, you can share ideas, you share ideas with other organisations, with other community groups around the UK. So, you know, utilise the local media, which is what we've done, I think, pretty successfully. Um, in terms of gauging how successful we've been, we've done two or three things, which I'm not going to go into great detail tonight because there's not an awful lot of time. But we, we measure in two or three different ways the, 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 the benefits of what we do and how much water is being slowed and stored in these leaky dams. And one of the systems is the, the V-notch weirs, which um, any engineers amongst us will know exactly how these things work. It's a much easier way of measuring the flow of water through that, that gap that you can see on the screen now. Uh, you can't quite see it because it's just behind the blue plate at the top, the blue banner at the top. There's a, there's a transducer at the top, which also measures the flow. And that information is, is recorded onto a laptop. There's one at the top of one of the, uh, streams and there's one at the bottom and you measure the input at the top and then you measure the output at the bottom and you compare the two we've also got a control stream next to it and we've done exactly the same there with the v notch we're at the top the v notch we're at the bottom only in that stream there's no leaky dams so you know what the effect would be without doing anything and you compare one with the other and typically when we've looked at this uh we've looked at and analyzed the data we're saving we're slowing the flow by about 30 to 40 minutes in this particular area um so um 
we are, uh, you know, we, that's just one of the one of the areas, one of the things that we are looking at monitoring because we have to do it because we're partly funded by the Environment Agency and by Calderdale Council in the past, and they want to know how successful we've been. You know, they need to know where their money's going, so we've had to kind of, you know, manage the manage the manage the monitoring as well. Um, we're working on the next set of data from the last year or so, which should be published on the website in the next month or so. Uh, we're working on that now. So again, you know, we'll be able to share that through the usual channels uh, in the coming months. We've also put in next to a lot of the leaky dams, these time-lapse cameras. So anything, again, that you do, monitor it, get some time-lapse cameras. They cost a couple of hundred quid, uh, and you can put them next to the bits that you've you've intervened with, you know, your leaky dams or your, your tree planting plantation um, or your hedgerows, and just to monitor and see how the water moves, because this is this is... Again, on the YouTube channel, which we've referred to already, um, uh, this footage is on there. It's not that exciting. It's not The Matrix. It's not, uh, it's not uh, you know, it's not um, a, a film from Hollywood. <laughs> it's quite dull, but it does give us an opportunity to monitor um, how the leaky dams work. Um, and it, it quite clearly, you know, that show, you can quite clearly show there, you know, how, how, the, how the leaky dams work using these time-lapse cameras. We also engage with walkers, local walkers that walk through the woods, and we say, take your camera, get your camera out, and stick it in that groove along the top where it says, above where with that little black mark, and you stick your camera in there, okay, you take a photograph, and then you send us the footage. It's especially useful if it's just had a big rainstorm and you can see the leaky dams filling up. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Um, so again, you know, this is, this is citizen science stuff. This is stuff that everybody can 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 uh, get involved in and, and engage themselves in as they're walking through the woods. Um, so that was the first project that we did. OK, the project at, with that National Trust at Hardcastle Crags. And that's been going on. That's we're, we're trying to get back there now. We're trying to get back there in June, July time to continue the work because we've not been there all year because of COVID. Um, but we've got some more work to do and also on neighbouring properties as well. And again, those relationships with all the landowners, which I'm going to come to in a few minutes, are critical to the success of this project. And it will be the success of yours as well, is engaging with the landowners. So I'm going to shut up for five minutes while Amanda gives you a little bit of an overview. And I touched on this right at the top of the call about sustainable drainage. Um, again, this is another um, another way of, of you and your community and your neighbours engaging with the process of, of natural flood management and trying to reduce flood risk. So I'll, I'll, let Amanda, I'll let Amanda take over at this stage and then I'll come back in a few minutes. Okay, thanks Adrian. Um, yeah, I think the first thing to say about sustainable drainage, which I'll, I'll call SUDS for short. Um, so SUDS is Sustainable Drainage Systems and NFM when we say that is natural flood management. And actually, they are, they're essentially the same thing, um, but we tend to use NFM to um, describe the kind of more rural context and larger scale. Um, and SUDS, we generally are describing developed areas and smaller scale um, interventions. Um, so NFM, you might be talking about leaky dams and um, restoration of blanket bog and woodland planting. Um, and attenuation basins in large fields and sustainable drainage systems, you're probably talking about green roofs and um, permeable paving and smaller ponds um, and rain gardens and all that sort of more urban context um, thing. So yeah, and as Adrian, as Adrian sort of described how um, we have used our own projects and things that we've built ourselves, um, but actually what we recognize that slow the flow as a voluntary organization can't do enough of this stuff ourselves to make the difference. So a, a big part of what we do is about um, educating people and advocating people um, to do this themselves. Um, so local landowners and homeowners and everybody and anybody, um, what we need is for everybody to do this everywhere and then it can make the big difference. Um, so yeah, Adrian, next slide. Yeah, um, oh, this was just um, the, uh, you'll, you, you'll start to see this graph often if you get into the world of NFM and SUDS. Um, 
and all it is is that um, the dotted line is um, essentially the flood level um, and we're trying to keep the curve of the water um, underneath that flood level um, and slow the, slow the flow of the water over time um, so that it doesn't flood. Um, and we accept that also hard engineering is also often needed, but the natural flood management and sustainable drainage systems can work in tandem with that um, to sort of mean that you have to build um, less high walls in the bottom of your valley. Um, and they carry a lot of additional benefits as well, um, like your green infrastructure benefits. So there's air quality, water quality, biodiversity, mental and physical health. Um, you know, there's all sorts of wonderful additional things that come with NFM and SUDS, um, which is why we advocate it. Next slide, please. Um, this was one of our early projects, which is still all the information is on our website, um, the You Can Slow the Flow project. And that was all about trying to um, educate people locally about what you can do in your own space. Um, so we've got um, four printable PDFs called at home, at school, at work and in public spaces. And we've also got a sort of general topic um, page. You are welcome to use all of this information, share it with people, use it to help you advocate NFM and SUDS. Um, just make sure you give Slow the Flow a credit, but we are keen for everybody to use this and share it um, to help with your own project as well. Um, and then, yes, we've now taken that, that sort of idea forward to location specific opportunity mapping. And so far we've mapped a pilot area, um, which is in Northern Mytham Road, which is one of our, our towns um, along the Calder. Um, and what this is, is we are, um, we've gone and sort of parceled up the land and so it, it might be a, a street or a field um, and uh, carry on one more and you'll see it um, zoomed in a bit yeah um, so yeah so we've sort of gone to every field and said what do we think we could do here um, you know, and this is without the benefit of any you know detailed site surveys and things um, it's just about saying what do we think the opportunities could be? What could it look like if you did NFM and SUDS everywhere? And what sort of volumes um, does that equate to? And then we've then produced a little report about, um, you know, what sort of impact could that have um, compared to the flood levels we've experienced? Um, just to try and give people that extra bit of inspiration as to, okay, so what could I actually realistically, physically do on my patch to help? And I, and I think that's really, really important because I think often people feel that, you know, people are, uh, the powers that be are making decisions about their lives, you know, that maybe they don't agree with, or they think, well, it's someone else's responsibility to reduce flood risk, or it's someone else's responsibility to build that flood wall, or it's someone else's responsibility to go and plant those trees. Actually, we've all got a responsibility, you know, and I, I know I'm preaching to the converted because you all sat here this evening. But, um, you know, it's really important that we try and engage with the community around us and other people around us to motivate us all to take responsibility for our own flood risk and for our own uh, safety. Um, I'm it's worth saying as well that, so, you know, the, all of the all development has exacerbated flooding problems. So. You yes. know, we're, we're sort of all responsible for, you know, creating the problem in the first place, which climate change is only going to make worse. And so as well as doing all of, you know, um, you know, there's, there's legislation sort of coming in about um, doing these things when you've got new development. But actually, we need to go back and retrofit everywhere um, to try and mimic nature better and slow the flow, you know, across the board where we've already got development and have already created the problem. So one of the one of the tasks that, that Amanda's undertaken is, uh, you know, if any if any building, but uh, large building projects, I mean, a bit like Matthew was telling me about the one in Corby earlier, uh, you know, is uh, those large building projects underway, uh, although it sounds sounds like a, a fait accompli, um, you know, there are still there's hopefully still time for you to impress upon the powers that be and the decision makers that, that by utilising um, sympathetic SUD schemes, you know, it will not have quite the same detrimental and devastating effect it could have had if they just literally stick a load of concrete down on the on the on the car park and the car park floors, you know, and front gardens and front driveways. 
Um, and, and we, we don't need to be against development because actually yeah. there are things you can do that, you know, particularly with new development that can reduce the flood risk overall. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it, we, we, we're not anti-development, but if you do it in the right way. Indeed. So um, the website, if you haven't, if any of you have not yet been on the website, it's slowtheflow.net. And there's some amazing resource on there. Even if I say so myself, we, we have worked extraordinarily hard over the last year, particularly while we've been in lockdown, to develop the website. And we get people blogging for us and guest blogs and articles and news stories and, and things of interest to, to, to promote the whole ethos around natural flood management and sustainable drainage. So if you go to the, I'll show you the website in a minute. Um, and, and, and please have a look on there. There's some absolutely fabulous articles and links and ideas that you can use. Um, but you could probably spend a day on the website. I reckon someone who, you know, wanted to really do a lot of research, there's a lot of information on there. So um, I'm going to move on to the next and sort of penultimate or penultimate project that we've been working on. So as well as Hardcastle Crags, which was looking at uh, leaky woody dams and a bit of tree planting, and then there was the sustainable drainage. The next uh, scheme that we developed last year was something on our website, again, called Volunteer Your Land, okay? Because it became apparent to us that people wanted to do stuff, but they maybe were time poor. They couldn't have, they had their families to think about on a Sunday morning. But a lot of these people had an acre or two of land up on the tops and and they were you know we were wanting to engage with those people to identify those areas of land that might be utilized for natural flood management purposes so attenuation ponds storage ponds tree planting hedge planting leaky dams those kind of things and so we put together a process with our local council calderdale um, to put together what's called the natural flood management grant scheme which is uh, up till now a government funded uh, scheme that we had a million pounds out of the government after the Boxing Day floods. Most of that has now been spent um, and they've, they've, they've funded about 20, 25 schemes around Calderdale, which people uh, submitted applications to and then the, 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 the funds paid for the tree planting, the attenuation ponds, etc. But then we started back last year, we started to realize actually this is starting to lose its traction a little bit. We needed to engage with people again. So on our website, we devised uh, this page um, to explain what we wanted people to do. Uh, and we wanted them essentially to think about how and if their land could be used for natural flood management purposes. Now, an example of this, is this video, which I'm just going to play in the background. Now, this land belongs to one of our other trustees, a guy called Stuart Bradshaw, who uh, is a civil engineer, understands about the land, and he wanted to try this out. He wanted to do this for himself, to protect a small community of houses down a hill. Because beforehand, those little, that small little hamlet was constantly getting flooded by the runoff from his land. So he built this great big ditch, this great big hole in the ground, using the grant scheme, using a, a professional contractor, a digger, and he did all the calculations and he did all the working out and made sure that it, it was you know, going to work properly. Basically, the water comes in from the bottom there and it leaves just to the right-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side of the, the lowest part of the land. Uh, but he plugs it at that point, and then once the storm's passed, he lets the water out a bit slower. So it, it attenuates about, in that pond alone, uh, 350,000 litres of water. This smaller pond, which is just next to it, holds about 150,000 litres of water. So collectively, these two ponds have, will attenuate or save half a million litres of water in a storm condition. And that's just one pond. Now, there's about 15, 20 of these around Calderdale now, funded uh, in most, mostly by the, the grant fund. And we're still looking for more. And it's, it's a great way of engaging with the local community because what we didn't want to happen was for the, uh, let me just get the, um, get the, there we go. What we didn't want to happen, we didn't want the flow of land to dry up, excuse the pun. We wanted people to come to us offering more land. So that would encourage the local council to go and look for more money and go and look for more funding for more up, upland 
uh, management processes such as such as this attenuation pond. And there's, there's as I say, there's 15 of these around Calderdale now. Um, and so over the last, getting on for a year now, we've managed to identify about 30 or 40 new la uh, landowners who have come to us with these tracts of land. Now, Calderdale at the moment are going through the ruminations of, uh, of, of um, uh, appraising and auditing the land. They will not all be suitable for whatever, for one reason or another, but we're hoping that one or two of them will be. But when we get the next big batch of funding through and Calderdale gets the next big tranche of funding through, we've then got these shovel ready schemes to go ahead. Had we not put this page up on the website and worked hard with the landowners and the local people that live above on the tops, appealing to their good nature to look after their neighbours downstream, we would never have found these 30 or 40 new schemes. So, you know, these kind of initiatives are really important to engage with the local community. We actually won um, a Community Foundation Award for the best marketing campaign uh, just before Christmas for this page, um, which we're quite pleased about because, uh, you know, it gave us even more publicity. And since then, we've, we've, we've managed to get even more people come forward and uh, tell us about their land, which is which is fantastic. So um, again, hey, Jane, I think, I think that's a good point. I'll just, yeah, and you have sort of already said it, but as a new community group starting out, I think it's one of the most wonderful things that we've done and Adrian has really driven it, is to really just communicate all the time what you're doing with everybody. And that kind of the, the traction and the, you know, the recognition that we've had for our work as you know has really kind of snowballed mm. and and it has meant that we can do a lot more and we can encourage mm. a lot more people and our reach on social media is now huge yeah. and that all helps us to do good work educating and advocating for nfm it's true but you talk about it really loudly uh, <laughs> um on the website, okay, um, and I might just take you there in a moment. On the website, under the About Us bit, is uh, a little section. Just drop this down if you've got a pen handy. Slowing the flow together. Just remember, slowing the flow together. That is a series of short films that we made about the work that we do. And if you're setting up your own, your own community group for this, I'd encourage you to watch that film. It's about 20 minutes long. It's made up of about eight shorter films you can watch them either individually or together as the big film um, and i'd very much recommend that you watch that film because it gives you a real good insight as to what the challenge was how we came together what we do and why it works and it's it's a really good short film and and we're very lucky to have had a really acclaimed filmmaker make that for us um, a couple of years ago so have a look at that right we are nearly at the end I'm sure you're quite bored of me prattling on now after half an hour or so. Um, I think the if, if you get nothing else out of tonight, it's, it's just to ask yourselves the question, what can you do as individuals and what can you do as, as, as a community? And there's a lot you can do, as we've, we've kind of touched upon. Um, you know, look, if you Google working with natural processes, um, if you haven't already, it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a a booklet it's an information written by the environment agency in defra and it's called working with natural processes i'd very much encourage you to have a look at that um, because it's our bible if you like it gives you lots of ideas lots of inspiration about the kind of things that you can do as a community and as individuals as well uh, network we touched on this i think uh, right at the top of the meeting or maybe before when before you all joined us me and matthew we were talking about networking liaise with people that make decisions about your community. So your local councillors, your local leaders, your, your local MPs, your, Euro, uh, well, I can say European MPs, no, there's more, do we? <laughs> your, you know, the people that make decisions about the community that we live in, they're the people that need influencing. They're the people that need to be led and educated and taught about working with natural processes. We've done that very successfully up here. We've got two MPs local to us who uh, work with us. One of them slightly better than the other one, but equally, you know, they're both supportive. Um, and so, uh, you know, get your MPs on board, get all of your local councillors on board, not just the ones that are easy to talk to, get the ones that are not easy to talk to as well, because collectively they will be a force to help you over the line and over to the next stage. Um, 
find out who your local media is. Find out, you know, you, you look on uh, whatever your local, uh, up here we have Look North and Calendar. You'll have the same down in the, you know, in the East Midlands. Um, find out who your local reporters are. Tweet them, follow them on Twitter. Go and um, harass them a little bit. Send them some information on what you're doing. And then when an incident happens, which it will because climate change is here, uh, and it's going to affect all of our lives, as we all know. Then when these things do happen, you've already made the contact with them. And then you can invite them along and say, look, you know, we've been banging on about this for two years, three years, four years, et cetera. Come and, come and chat to us. We'd love to, love to show you the devastation that these floods are causing to our community. Um, talk to each other and talk to other groups. I've, I've already mentioned to Matthew tonight that there's um, a couple of organized, a couple of people that, that I would very much recommend that you do liaise with if you're on twitter there's a wonderful woman called flood mary at flood mary um, and she is called mary donauer which, and it's spelled d-h-o-n-a-u uh, but if you go and search for flood mary she's fabulous she's she uh talks a lot about flood resilience and, and about making your home and your community flood resistant um because we will flood and we just have to try and make you know make sure that we you know the impact and the the, uh, the impact is, is as reduced as we possibly can so you know go and go and talk to these people get in touch with the national flood forum they're not they're not based a million miles from you i don't think i can't quite remember i think it's nottingham somewhere um but it's uh, it's that kind of area um try out some of the things that amanda was talking about try you know use a water butt um amanda you'll be able to tell me that i'm hoping i'm putting you on the spot now we did a, a report uh, off the back. I think Amanda allude, alluded to it. We did a report off the opportunity mapping in more Mythenwood, and we extrapolated the amount of water that could be saved uh, or attenuated and stored if everyone in Calderdale utilised a form of sustainable drainage. And the amount of water that could be attenuated was... It was... A number that I always forget. I'm hoping Amanda knows it. Um, I'm just looking it up now because yeah. I don't want to get it wrong. No, it was a massive, massive number. And <laughs> it was almost 2 million cubic metres of water um, that could possibly be attenuated using NFM and SUDS. Yeah, and that's in an area that's not that big. You know, that is, that is Calderdale, you know, which is sort of 15 miles long and five miles deep. Um, so that's a lot of water that if we all play our parts, we've all got a role to play in this. It's not for someone else to do. It's not for the politicians to make all those decisions and to make, you know, to make those things happen. It's for all of us to do these things. Um, I, that, that's what I believe anyway, I'm afraid. Um, hey, Adrian and Amanda, is it, is it, are you open to questions now? Is that, uh, yeah, we just, we just, I'm about one minute away, Matthew, actually. Okay. Um, finally, um, the, uh, our social media so please follow us on twitter if you're on twitter the youtube channel is slow the flow actually i think it might be slow the flow calderdale although amanda has put the, the uh, link in the chat if you want to go and find that in the chat we're on facebook there's our fa our website at the drop bottom and our email secretary at slow the flow.net so if we don't answer your question adequately tonight and you want to you know you're, you know you're too shy to ask a question or whatever then please you know email us uh, but please also follow her, follow us on social media. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for, for listening. I'm going to keep the record function going, um, but I am going to stop the share and then um, ask some questions and Matthew will... Uh... Well, yeah, firstly, thank you very much, Adrian and Amanda. I mean, it's great to see your group and, and, and the extent of the work that you've done and clearly having a, a significant impact on on communities in the colder, colder area. I've got loads of questions. I, I, if I'm allowed to just jump in and go first, which I'm going to do yeah, anyway. Crack on, crack I've on. Got three questions. Um, and what, what the first is more of a, an acknowledgement that particularly along our catchment area, the origin of the floods and the origin of the water actually uh, originates from communities that don't flood. So we own the problem, they are there in the origin of the water. And I wonder what's your advice on engaging people who don't necessarily have a problem with the flood, 
but actually are essential to the answer. Yeah. That's one question. Really, really difficult. It's really difficult. <laughs> um, I'm sure you've got the answer, so that's good. Um, this, the, second, <laughs> the second question is, your, that farmer is, uh, who built those attenuation ponds is absolutely priceless. Uh, I'm very interested to know what those ponds cost, just as a mental note of how much did that cost to install and maintain? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, how do you engage farmers who are not in the same mindset, whose starting point is not necessarily to proactively engage? Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what experience you've got successfully of engaging farmers who needed to be convinced. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, actually, I think I'll leave it there. I, I, I think that the, 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 yeah, the engagement with farmers, the cost and, and, and how do you engage communities who don't actually have the problem? It's, it is, it is a, that is the biggest challenge. That is the biggest challenge that you will face. And I don't have an answer. I don't, I simply don't have an answer for that, Matthew. Um, it, it, it is a matter of um, appealing to their, their better nature, their better side, by making you know becoming friends with them, you know it's it's a matter you know it's not it's not going to be a business transaction from the from the get go. It's about you know understanding why they won't necessarily uh, or what what their challenges are, you know, and and why they won't necessarily comply or why they don't agree with what you're doing maybe or what they're you know what what they perceive to be what's in it for them. You know, what is in it for them? Now, the grant scheme that we set up with Calderdale Council, clearly um, that was cost neutral to the landowner broadly. You know, it should be cost neutral to the landowner. So if you can have something like that set up, utilising some of the money that you've had from this innovation fund, for instance, uh, you know, which compensates the landowner for the use of their land, uh, that attenuation pond... Um, do you, do you know the cost of that, Amanda? I don't know the cost specifically of that one, but I do. I do think that yeah, you're right, Adrian. It's it's if you can have you know a lot of it's about the finances, and so people are prepared to help, and they you know they want to help, but there's not a great deal of people that are going to do it out of their own pocket no. if they're not doing anything anyway. But one of the things that I think we've done fairly successfully and continue to try to do is if you educate people about why this is a good idea, then the next time they're doing some work anyway, then they might just think about doing this and sort of incorporating it in their design so that it doesn't necessarily have to cost more. And in fact, it can save people money sometimes doing these type of works um, because they solve other problems they might have had. Or, you know, they they might have waterlogged land that's an issue for them that they can solve in this way or um you know people doing work to their house or garage or what have you by putting a green roof in in the mix you might save on your energy bills you know and all of these things it's just about educating people and getting them to a point where the next time they're doing something they're thinking about doing nfm and suds as part of it and I think we've as as well. I don't know what the community response to cleaning up after your flood event was. In Calderdale, it was amazing how many people turned out to help their friends and neighbours, mm. and you know came down from the hillsides to come and help clean up in the bottom of the valley. So one of the things we've been able to say to people is, you know, how about instead of cleaning up next time, if we all do our bit now, we can help to prevent it from happening again. Mm. And I think people have responded quite you know in a very neighborly way sometimes mm. we we're quite fortunate here in that we one of the other parties that put the uh, nfm grant fund together with calderdale was a chap that runs um, a company and an organization as a land manager for farmers so he knows a lot of the farmers if not all the farmers in the area um, so you know it might be that you have to liaise and get some connections with the, the nfu for instance you know who yeah the National Farmers Union that, that have those links into the farming community. They're a tough bunch to crack, aren't they? They really are. But it's also <laughs> worth saying as well, Matthew, that, and you'll probably know this already, that not all the landowners are farmers. Um, you refer to the farmer on the attenuation pond uh, site. Uh, Stuart isn't a farmer. Stuart's a civil engineer. And, and he's one of hundreds of small landowners that own one, two, three, four, five, six acres of land 
which you know could be used for, for purposes such as that or tree planting or whatever. So don't be too um, don't be too concerned if you can't get one of the really obstreperous, you know, stick in the mud farmers, large farmers, because there are going to be lots and lots of smaller landowners and smaller smallholders that will, you know, probably be easier to liaise with them. And, and it's a matter of understanding what their reticence is and, and why they won't do it. And if it's financial, well, then, you know, there might be a solution there with utilising some funds for that. Um, in terms of the... Sorry to jump in, Adrian. Um, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll let you continue, but I'll, it's, I've been sitting there quietly with a bunch of questions. A few things I could probably clarify, um, but completely agree with your point. Um, we'll be trying to sort out the large farmers, but we bought, we also need that um, engagement from all the multiple small landholders mm -hmm. in the area, and that'll be part mm -hmm. of our community engagement. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, again... Uh, I could probably spend another hour talking, following up from all your points, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll try not to go into that. Um, if Do you mind if I just run a few questions past you? Um, apologies. Yes, can I, just I, I don't know what I, I to do at the beginning. I get it, can I just jump in with, so one thing that's coming up that will probably be useful is the ELMS scheme, the Environmental Land Management Scheme. And so that will hopefully um, include provision for you know natural flood management to improve biodiversity and um, that side of things so it should be the case that farmers might be more amenable to these solutions through that scheme um, and it can yeah. go hand in hand exactly uh, i'd be quite interested in working through some of those kind of cost breakers on attenuation schemes just to kind of do a bit of um uh, just to, to kind of quantify again some of the figures we've got um, but essentially, uh, we're going to be talking about both. We'll be looking to both fund um, properties and both encourage people to take up uh, measures as well. And it's going to be on a catchment scale, NFM, nature-based solutions, SUDS. We'll yeah. be looking at community level. And, you know, our part of our job is over the next six years is, is to enable the community to actually respond. So we'll be actually working with them to establish um, flood warnings to have um, your emergency plans in place. We'll be looking to establish a local supply of um, property flood resilience, um, have the alerts out there and everyone's actually in a local group where they can inform and help each other. Like you mentioned, um, I think that the, the quick response that you can get is, is the most immediate thing you can have. Uh, I'm very pleased you're um, an advocate of Flood Mary. I was on the phone to her about five times today. Um, <laughs> We, we've got a mobile demonstration vehicle we'll be using to demonstrate PFR as part of our Resilience Fund project. We had a project, uh, an event today in Cambridge here, um, so about 100 people turned up and we we're demonstrating about 50 PFR projects, uh, products that we've got on our trailer and also discussing the local issues and how potentially that they can look for advice. Um, so, um, yeah, very much aligned. And... Any questions I do ask, I, I'd always precedence with, I'm very much a fan and I believe in all the things you guys are saying, it's it's only been the council side to me that I have to kind of ask questions like, um, in terms of kind of measuring the effects of your work and leaky dams, it's been, you can measure the effect of a flow rate very scientifically, but quantifying how that actually affects flooding downstream um, surface level, uh, surface water flooding, uh, fluvial flooding, etc. Um, it, it, it's I've I've never found kind of concrete figures on that. I don't know if you guys have anything it's, that you've come to. If you drop me uh, an email to Secretary at Slow the Flow, Alan, um, we'll dig out some some detail on that. Um, it's not myself that does the, the number crunching. Uh, it's actually Stuart Bradshaw who who has generation ponds. Uh, on his land and he does all he's a civil engineer um, and all this actually came about as a result of, of Stuart actually it was his brain okay. it was all this so uh, he'll be able to share with you some numbers historically he'll also be able to share with you uh, the numbers that he's in the middle of crunching as we speak uh, in the next few weeks and months or so um, so that, that's the kind of you know the hard the hard numbers it is a very difficult thing to categorically prove 
anecdotally, people that live on the river between Hardcastle Crags and Hebden Bridge comment to us that the river and the water moves in a different way as a result. And they put that down to the result of the like, leaky dams being there. But that is anecdotal. No, I, I do have... I commissioned Mary to make a series of videos this year. Um, so we updated her e-magazine. Um, sorry, I'll introduce myself. I didn't even do that at the beginning. Uh, it's yours. <laughs> Alan Ryan, I work for uh, North, Hams Count, North, North North Hams Council now. We used to be North Hampshire County Council um, until April. So I'm running one of the EA Pathfinder projects across the country. Okay. So we've got one in the north. I've got the Oxcam Cambridge region. And then there's one down in Devon and Cornwall. So we've got eight local authorities covering the entire remit from kind of here uh, across Beds, Bucks, Milton Keynes, Peterborough, mm -hmm. Kingshire, et cetera. Right, OK. And then uh, once I wrap up on this project, I'm going to be taking over on the Resilience Fund project. So um, it's one of our catchment areas. So again, mm -hmm. that's why I'm here tonight, is just understand some of the messaging, uh, exactly what you guys are kind of proposing. Um, again, like I say, it's all stuff that we we highly advocate in various levels to different means. Um, I'll probably pick it up offline. It's not the kind of stuff people want to hear. I'm interested in how you're funded. I, uh, I don't know. I, I would. I, I just want to say, I, I, if if people are you know starting community group and starting to think about doing these things, it is one of the most important things you can do is monitor it. And try and help um, contribute to that, you know, that data and that evidence for NFM and SUDS, because there's, you know, there is a growing data, you know, data set, but it's not well evidenced enough because it is so hard to quantify some of this stuff. Um, that's so, what I've liked about what you've said, to be honest. There's, there's and if you, if you said different, I would have been quite uh, pessimistic. I, <laughs> but there's a lot I of had people, a meeting you know, today. like Alan, who have got money, want to spend it on NFM, and you, but but those you know um, councils and the environment agency and water authorities, they want to have proof that their money is being well spent. Yeah. And so we need to help them to get that proof because it's not there's not enough of it out there. Mm. No, I, I had a meeting today with Viridian. They're like they're one of the major consultancies that would be an expert in this area and potentially would be doing the modeling for this. So what we want to actually do is to try and figure out exactly where you guys are at in terms of the entire situation from catchment to community to property level across the entire remit, all your exposure, all your risk to flooding. And then we're looking at investigating all of the measures we can take across all of those three areas and actually see what the impact we can make. And then at the end, we'll be measuring this. So mm. to be honest, nobody's actually got information that they've modeled and actually tested. Um, and nationally, that's the thing. So it is, it, it's a national challenge, um, it but is. it's one we're actually going to be taking up. So to the other people on the call, I would say, um, there's there's a lot of good news. We've got a lot of positive things coming up. We've got a supply aggregate of landowners already established within the area. We've got funding from Nestle, Anglian Water, leveraged with the Environment Agency. Um, so instead of elms, we're doing lens, but that's something we've established already. And there's an auction process for these. Um, so again, it's voluntary farmers. We're absolutely going to be needing them. We're going to need those small landowners. We're going to need the community to actually inform us on who all these people are. And the most important thing is not about chucking money at it. It's, it's the people on this call, the parish council and the local people that understand the issues is getting from them what they think we really have to do, what the best options are and combining that into the whole package. Because again, it, everyone, it, it's going to be very, very locally led. So Hopefully the parish council will be enthused by that, and we really want to engage those local stakeholders for this. That sounds great, and I think that um, you know, so the flow. We are we are merely well, merely trustees. We are all are all volunteers. Okay, we all have day jobs, 
and we do this in our spare time evenings weekends and you know occasionally during the day it sounded like it yeah <laughs> and and so you know our capacity to to do very much more than what we've done so far is limited by that because we all have livings to make you know um so you know we we do simply concern ourselves with those three as three major projects that I spoke about tonight. And could we do more? You bet your bottom dollar we could do more. Um, but we could probably employ, not employ nine <laughs> people instead of having nine trustees. You know, um, it's a big undertaking. And then Calderdale isn't that big. You know, Calderdale is really not that big an area. It's a very challenging area when it comes to flood, flood risk, but this is not a massive area. But thank you, Alan. It's really, what was your job title again? I know that where you said you're from, but what, what's your position again? Um, I'm the project manager for the Oxcam PFR Pathfinder. Yeah, right. okay. So if you want to uh, drop us an email with any other kind of specific questions or um, guidance, what I would also in, invite you up to see us as well. If And this goes to anybody on this call. If anybody wants to come up and see the projects for themselves, we're, we're only a a short two or three hour drive up from Northampton up to uh, Leeds and turn left. Um, we do ask from everywhere here. There you, go. <laughs> there you go. It's a beautiful part of the world and you'd be more than welcome to come and see some of the stuff that we're doing. Um, and we'd be delighted to show you. Um, did we answer your question, Matthew, in its entirety? Other than the cost, I think you did. Yeah. Well, um, okay, um, I, I texted Stuart while you, we were talking there to ask him what the cost was. I want to say it was in the tens, low tens of thousands in total. It wasn't. It wasn't. They, they tend to be that sort. Yeah, it's ten to ten to twenty thousand uh, pounds. You know that kind of cost, and it's the cost of a digger. Uh, you know, for uh, for a, for a month. You know, uh, Stuart's done a bit more there. If I showed you that video again, you'd see a lot of tree planting around the outside. You'd see a channel. He's redirected some of the water around, just around his land, to direct it in to the attenuation pond. Uh, yeah. well, he can choose, he's got a gate actually. He doesn't have to go in there, but he can slide the gate in and he directs it in. So that's gonna co have costed him a little bit. We, more. We should I, I think well one of the observations from hearing Alan speak, and that's all that you've said is very encouraging. Um, the six year time scale is slightly alarming. Um, and as a resident, uh, I'm keen that we do as much as we can to mitigate from now onwards. Mm. Um, I, what I'll be interested in is looking at what communities can start now that is totally consistent with what everyone else is doing on a bigger scale, mm. whether that's tree planting, whether that's getting landowners to proactively put in attenuation ponds, proactively put in hedges, correct ditches, correct clear, clear culverts uh, and things of that nature. Um, but it's, so I'm very keen that we... Uh, I'd rather not be flooded again. And I'm sure the residents of Brigstock will feel the same. We don't really want to go through that again if we can possibly avoid it. Um, so the, 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 the quick wins in the short term, as much as the very, very positive medium and long term is equally important. Mm. It, is, it is. I think that's a very good point. And I think that's something that between the three of us, um, we could potentially pick up offline if we're planning some things down the road, we could talk about some of the medium to long term things that wouldn't then conflict with what you could advise for the short term. Now, and again, we're talking about short term NFM nature based solutions. We're also going to be discussing uh, property level resistance. And, you know, as you're discussing with Mary Donu, it's how mm. you protect your own property as well. Mm. So, all the work we're going to do about we could we can spend and we will literally be spending millions within the region over a six year period. We can never ever guarantee and we won't say you will flood again. It's to what level and to what frequency. And it's about resilience when you do flood as well. So, you know, we unfortunately you can't fight nature. So all the work we're doing, it does not affect the fact that you can also protect your own property. So if you're one of these people that thinks I have got to control myself, a lot of people take ownership. Some people think the council will never fix it for me and they think block drains will do it. It's never going to be the issue. You might think because you're living on the side of a hill that you're not going to have surface water flooding again, not the issue. So, you know, it's you can help yourself 
you can start working towards building up your community effort. And we can also start building that catchment level and look into where potential like leaky dams, volunteer work, rather than capital investment could work. So, you know, that's the plan is bring them all together as quickly as we can. So we, six years isn't a bad thing. We've got, we've got it for six years. We're not planning on waiting six years. So normally <laughs> these projects only last one or two years, six years, and the amount of capital is very, very rare. So, mm. it's, it's and, and hopefully as well, of course, it might serve as a springboard for further monies as well. You know, that, there's, there's, there's always that as well. Well I, well, I think being an exemplar, I think there's an opportunity to be an example for other areas. So Indeed. You, get, you get stuff right and you measure it and you show cause yeah. and effect, get some nice science in there, and it becomes something that's replicable in other areas. Yes, um, we, we won't uh, necessarily comment on uh, your local area because we don't know it. Um, you know, we, we, we couldn't, you'd have to get, you know, uh, it, it's not that, you know, people say, well, what, what can we do here? What can we do there? We don't, we know our way, we know Calderdale, we know Calderdale very well. We can kind of point you in the direction of, of what, what has worked for us, but we're quite hesitant about saying, you know, well, you know, you could put that there, or you could do that there. It's not really for us to say that at this stage. Uh, we're very fortunate in having Stuart Bradshaw, who's our civil engineer, you know, uh, a trustee. And, and he's, you know, we, we, and, and if you haven't already, uh, it's, we were, we're very much worth finding. Uh, and I'm sure Alan's probably got uh, roads into this because through the connections that he'd already have. But, you know, civil engineering is a big part of doing this kind of work, um, as we all know. So, uh, Excellent. Questions from anybody else? Hello. You've got Nigel Searle underneath your name, but I'm assuming, I don't know if that's your name, and you're muted at the moment. Can you unmute yourself? There we go. No, I'm Sally Wilkes. I'm a uh, councillor. Hi. Um, Hi. Yeah, I mean, we've got uh, landowners who are willing to have stuff done. Mm. They just need the expertise. They need somebody to tell them what to do and where to do it. Yes. And maybe a, a, a bit of uh, funding as well. Um, and I think that's what's what's lacking at the moment. There doesn't seem to be any um, anybody available to expertise. tell them yeah, what mm. to do. Mm. Sure. I, I did think while, while we were discussing the previous point as well, we should say part of the cost of the attenuation basins is that professional expertise. Yes. So I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want you all to just go off out in your garden with a digger and try and dig an attenuation <laughs> basin. You know, you, you do need Don't that, do that. Kind of, that Don't civil do engineering that. input or the, and landscape architecture and, you know, yeah. you need the professional yeah. help as well. Um, we, yeah. Part, part of the, part of the uh, natural flood management grant scheme of Calderdale Council uh, you know, was all that professional expertise. Now, I don't know what you've got set up in the neck of the woods. Um, Sally, that, that, that's an excellent point about having, uh, starting to build a model. And I would ask for as much help as Alan and Adrian and Amanda can give in terms of what is the, to use an American term, the 101, what's the best practice on how you go from not having an attenuation pond to having a functioning attenuation pond where you've got a lot, I think the most difficult bit is not the money, it's the landowner going, yep, we're up for this. Where you've got that, how do you go from nothing to a functioning, is, is there a document, is there a process, is there advice on, well, you start with, uh, I know that there, um, uh, I forget the name of the consultancy, but part of the Pathfinder process is a group of consultants that, that advise on um, flood risk. Is it an organisation like that that says, okay, well, this is the size and type and depth and structure of the pond that you need. Now you need a contractor to build it. I can take that question. Um, and that's exactly the meeting we had today. So it's with a company that would do the data modelling for this. So essentially, their job would be to first understand the current situation, the flood risk and the opportunities. And then it's about laying out an approach on a kind of a tiered basis. Uh, farmers like knowing facts and figures. They like knowing this is my first option and that's the impact. This is my second option, that's the impact. This is my third option, that's the impact. And then they can go and actually see the benefits that each of them has against their own personal situation and weigh it up correctly. 
So that's all written in as part of our funding and as part of the modeling that we'll be doing. So again, that's that kind of large scale work. This is what we'll be providing as part of the project. What we'll be asking of you guys will be for the additional volunteers that we don't have signed up and also for the engagement with some hesitant farmers and trying to bring people on side. So we can provide that level of data. Um, and again, it'll be working with you guys then to see, can we get that engagement with some potential additional farmers? Great. Just put a link just, in the, just just a link just in the chat box. Let's take that to the next stream. If those landowners in Brigstock go, well, it, whilst we wait for the data, we want to at least have a go, is getting a digger and digging a hole a retrograde step, or is that at least, would you, are they at liberty to do that? And as I'm saying, actually, I think that both the three of us, myself, uh, yourself, Matthew and Adrian, it might be worth just exchanging a couple of emails or a call just to make sure we're coordinated. And then it's about knowing the correct, it, it's about the expertise. Everyone says the same thing. Um, I had a very angry farmer from Cambridge here this morning collecting our delivery vehicle. And he said, I've offered them 100 acres seven months ago. They don't want it. I don't want funding. I know what to do. Just let me do it and give me the permission. And a lot of people are in that kind of, you know, similar vein. So we're used to it. You're not in your own on that one. But <laughs> trust me. And that's the good thing is it's actually, it's, it's a rec very, very recognized condition. The other thing is, as you mentioned, people that it isn't their issue, but they're causing the problem. And again, we face that again today. We've got some very affluent houses that built a lot of um, stone walls to keep the flooding out of them and then flood it down the road. Mm -hmm. um, and you get these kind of issues. That's the kind of thing we hope to try to address at the community level where we want people to be involved, be a member of their flood risk, have flood wardens, have the community involved to help everyone out rather than pushing it down to the next person. So there's a there's a behavioral kind of aspect to that. Um, but certainly, you know, I think there's a lot of things that can be started immediately with some good guidance um, from Adrian. There's the there's the it pick off the, the, the low hanging fruit is what I'd suggest at the moment. Yeah. The um, things that where you need volunteer work and not capital funding. And if you organize a workforce, I'm sure Adrian could tell you very quickly how to use them. Um, on the group, on the chat, Amanda has put a link, uh, which obviously when we finish the call, I'll download and I'll send to Matthew. Uh, but it's, um, it's a, a link on our website called NFM Resources, and it includes what consents and approvals do you need? You can't clearly just go and dig a hole in the ground. Uh, you know, you need watercourse consents and you need planning permission potentially. So, uh, and I mean, Alan will know all about this, I'm sure. And and, and it will be all part of the process that, that you'll be having to put together. But in the group chat, as we've said, Amanda's already put that in. So um, uh, have a look at that. Have a look at that. Excellent. So, Sally, I'll, I'll be very interested to follow up with you. Um, are you part of the packet? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I am. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Super. Well, I think that's excellent. Any other questions? Yeah, I've got a question about maintenance of um, these ponds. Once mm -hmm. the ponds are being built and they're operating, do they just carry on existing without any significant maintenance costs, or are there maintenance costs that you've got to think about? And the farmer wants to know about. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm not. I'm not up on the specifics of that. I'll be honest. There is a in our grant fund at the Calderdale. There is a small amount of money for two or three years to pay for the maintenance. It's. I think it's just making sure that the the inlet pipes are running and the outlet pipe is running because you clearly if the outlet pipe gets blocked up, then it's not going to drain in the way that it's designed to drain and it must drain in the way that it's designed to drain. So I think there, you know, there has to be an eye on that. You're quite right, Robert. It, you know, you, you do need to make sure that, that those uh, maintenance is carried out. Same with the leaky dams, you know, any, any intervention that you do to change the course of water, you need to, you can't just do it. You've got to keep an eye on it and make sure that they're doing what they're designed to do. Um, but yes, absolutely, there, there, is, uh, there is some maintenance, albeit 
relatively cheap. I, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's minimal, but it is minimal. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah okay. I've got I've also a question about well. yeah, the leaky like, dams. What what sort of size rivers are they, or or streams are they suitable for? Um, um, for example, if you we've got the Harper's Brook, which for the most most of the year is just a sort of meandering. Fairly low level, gentle. How wide is it? How, how how wide is it, Robert? I guess at maximum, probably. Well, where where it comes through our area, I would say 20, 30 feet. Okay, that's quite wide. So we've been putting dams in very small tributaries that wide that carry water. You know, two or three days a year when it really rains, um, and then we've. We've, we've also put dams in some very, very deep incised gullies uh, in another part of Hardcastle Crags, which um, the gullies are maybe 10 foot deep, um, but they're dry for the most part. Um, but, and then the leaky dams might be anything from two foot to six, three, well, yeah, two to six foot high, six foot tops. Um, and then in the main channel that runs through Hardcastle Crags, is probably at its widest 20 to 30 foot would you say amanda about that um and there's one or two small you know leaky dams that, that go across there um but in the main they tend to be sm in the smaller tributaries there yeah. in the big because you've got to be so careful in the bigger in you know you can't having you can't be having those leaky dams being washed out in a flood causing damage further downstream obviously it's we should say those large ones that have not been built by volunteers. They're no. built by professional <laughs> contractors. And, yeah. You know, designed properly by yeah. engineers. Yeah. They're, so they're engineered leaky dams as yeah. to smaller leaky dams in the tributaries. Yeah, I can see that because I, I just styles. couldn't. In... We should say there are different styles of leaky dams. So ours tend to look a bit more natural, um, you would yeah. say. And then if you if you have a Google of the Pickering leaky dams, they look a bit more like horse yes. jumps though and yes. so you know you you'll you'll want to find the style that suits your area best um and your capabilities and materials that are available and things like that okay thanks again please come and have a you know if you find yourself in yorkshire uh just come and visit and, and come and see the different uh, I sound like I sound like I work for Yorkshire Tourist Board. Don't I? I can see a road trip coming on. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I will. Well, just going back to Alan's uh, comments earlier. Um, please bear in mind that our time is quite limited in terms of being able to um, respond quickly to, to requests. I don't know how much information you'll require from us, Alan, but just bear in mind that that we we get quite a lot of potential dialogue like this and we also hold our day jobs as well so if i don't come back to you you know just email me again i won't have forgotten it's just a matter of finding the time to come back to no me. problem at all i understand i just want to manage your expectation that's all and that's the pro and that's exactly it it's when i ask on funding it's, it's when it's volunteer led then you can only expect x amount but indeed you know if we can get that you, you've got some great material there specifically yes. One of the ones that's on schools, um, and we, we do want to work with schools a lot more, and that's something we might bring into it. So, um, again, if we're uh, if we think that that image might be useful for us, we might be in touch on that one as well. Mm. Um, but yeah, like I say, it's just to get a very quick. If we can get a kind of a coordination of some of the first things that these guys can start doing or thinking about. Um, it, we're not expecting you to turn up with volunteers or manage everything or anything like that. With a like shovel that. in our hands. <laughs> we're, we're, we've got a website. We've got all this material about engaging and how communities can do it for themselves as well. Um, yeah. But I think it's just whatever it needs is just that steer in the right direction. Sure, sure. And, you know, it, it's leaky dams work best and they're, they're very small, large scale rather than, mm. we're not talking about blocking off rivers. We're talking about putting hundreds of them Sure. In, in in a nice woodland area and making it look good and just gentle little streams but what's applicable i understand you can't also say this will work for you because yeah. if you're not standing there you, you need you a can't. local civil engineer alan you'll need a local civil engineer on board who will be able we'll, to we'll be doing that side to it so the generic kind of advice is what would be the most useful mm. sure well let's be you know let's let's be in touch yeah i would say as well i, I think oh, Amanda, I was just going to say in Calderdale, I think 
one of the real good things about slow the flow has been our relationship with the council um and how i th i think we've been able to reach more people because the community responds better to information coming from a community led group so i think ha you know having that real good relationship with the the statutory bodies in the council mm. has been helpful you know mm. to all of us as a kind of symbiotic thing we do we do enjoy a good reputation and people trust what we say and you know people don't always trust what a local council says for instance and local do they it's it's you know it, it, it we do we do tend to enjoy that the benefit of, of that and our you know we're quite fortunate in that respect um, anything else any other questions from anybody i've got a quick question Mark. probably more for Alan. Um, he mentioned modelling and data of, of um, basically the overall situation. I was just wondering, do we actually have data that we can base all this on? I mean, it's, it's easy to see what goes wrong when it's actually flooding, but now everything's dry. Is there any historical data showing where all this water is actually coming from? Because there's various developments in Corby and whatnot. Is there any modelling as, as you mentioned, it crosses both lines. So there's a lot of new developments, yet we've got historical data. So again, we've got this basic GIS data that you can, we've got that it goes to the acceptable level that everyone is happy with. But as you say, there's new developments all the time. The impact is obviously it's down to planning, but um, the, the actual outcomes of these can be different sometimes. Uh, we've got people on the ground telling us one thing, you've got data saying another. So it's always down to us to try and coordinate that effort. Yeah, um, I mean, that's the sort of thing I worry about. There's a lot of local effects. And if you look at the sort of surveying of, of the, the river as it goes along in terms of the, the data that's available to the public anyway, it's not often very accurate, to be honest. Yeah. And, that's it, not but... that's, and that's why we really, really, we're, we're trying to invest in the actual, the best data we can possibly get. Um, it, it breaks the entire catchment area into five meter by five meter chunks and analyzes the exact risk at all the actual points on that. So it's far beyond anything that you can get just publicly. Um, it's not going to be extortionate, but we're going to have to be paying for it, but that's funded by the Environment Agency. And that's the whole point of it is understanding that a lot, lot better than we do currently. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that worries me is having the data in terms of creating a big, a big project when you're spending that amount of money. You need to have a big overall picture of where all that water is coming from. I mean, there's a huge amount of water, but does anyone know the source of where it's actually coming from? Yeah, 100% agreed, and it's to varying aspects they do, but we need to make it better, and we're going to look at that once we understand it, how we can impact it. Okay. And that, that's more important is once you know the actual current situation, you know, as the agent's saying, you can't tell in an area until you've actually surveyed it perfectly and you've done it, and everything, you understand the local situation, you try to get it to that point and never be as accurate as you want it to be. There'll always be local information you wish you could feed into a data set <laughs> that somebody knows, but we will be doing our best and we'll be going through every loop all we can to actually make it as accurate as we can. One of the things that we started right at the beginning was surveying the river network. And we literally, every Sunday morning, myself and Stuart would walk and measure Every, almost the, the entire river network between the top end of the catchment all the way down to uh, where, where, we, where I am now, Sarby Bridge, uh, you know, and, and we, we measured the width of the river, the depth of the river, what the river ran on, uh, and we recorded all of this data thinking that the, um, the environment agency who said they were quite interested in it, although they, they had some of it already, uh, and we spent probably the first year doing that it was a lovely way of seeing in the countryside. And actually we gave the EA all the data and it was never used. <laughs> it, was never, <laughs> it, was com it was a complete, almost a complete waste of time. It wasn't a waste of time because actually what it meant was we got really familiar with the local topography and the local area, the local areas that actually, you know, where we, we, we you know, where, where the land was flat and where the land was hilly and how the water traveled through the catchment. So actually from that perspective, it taught us a lot 
There's no light feet on the ground walking a catchment. Yeah, honestly, you can only get so much modeling and surveying. So that's yeah, spending the time out there. Um, but yeah, we and the point is it's we can spend all the money we want on modeling, but we also need that volunteer army that are willing to go out there and verify and monitor these things. Definitely. So yeah. it, it, it has to come from both sides. Everyone on the call is actually committed to actually providing support from one side. So for once we've got a project with funding on the other and it matches up. Uh, it's just how we best do it from, from this point on. Yeah, I would get some confidence that, that we have a pool of people. It will get bigger, I'm sure, that will put waders on, get boots on, and are happy to be active. We've already seen that. Um, but you've been very generous with your time, everyone, and that, that includes guests and... and uh, yes, uh, thank and you. Adrian ...and Amanda, and that's, that's fantastic of you. Um, it's been fascinating, and I think the debate after the presentation is, uh, is fantastic. And... Um, in terms of not letting things drop, uh, yes, Alan, let's let's uh, be in contact about um, the what what next, and, and we will consume very avidly any advice that anyone has. And, and Sally, nice to meet you from um, from Brigstock Parish Council. I know you're in close contact with Robert, as David is from Lowick with Robert. Um, will be. Sorry, I think David's a new kid on the block, isn't you, David? With um, the flooding. Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm very new. I've been in position. Ten days. It? Ten days. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> David, get on with it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not actually our flood warden, so I'm gonna have to find out who our flood warden is. Actually. <laughs> well, I'm just, um, I, I've just popped the uh, the last screen on on the, the last slide on the screen again, just for you to see again you know, how you can contact us, I would absolutely recommend that you have a look on the website. As I said, you could spend hours on there trawling through all the information. Um, we've also, also, while we've been chatting, me and Amanda have worked a fantastic double act tonight, because while I've been doing all the chatting, <laughs> while, while Amanda, while I've been doing all the chatting, Amanda's been putting a lot of links in the chat. So we will be downloading those and I will send them to Matthew. And I'd urge you to look at those links as well. Uh, because they will be very pertinent to some of the aspects of the conversation that we've had this evening. Um, and, and thank you all for coming. Thank you for the invite, Matthew. It's been great. Oh, it's, it's a real pleasure. We're very grateful. And, and this will be recorded. So if there are members of PACM, I know that uh, Victor, I think, said there were a number of members that wanted to attend but couldn't. Um, so it will be available, I think, via a YouTube link, I think, Adrian. Is that correct? Yeah, well, we'll do that together now. When everyone okay. else leaves, um, I'll... Um, We'll, we'll, we'll save it. So, um, yeah, I think we've done, haven't we? I think we've exhausted yeah, this okay. topic. Well, well, thank you, everyone. You have your evenings back. Thank you. Thank you. Nice thank to you meet you. Everyone. Everyone. Yeah, thanks so much. Take care. Care. Thanks, Adrian. Thank thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Amanda. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for your time, Alan. Do let us know how you get on. <laughs> right. Well,